All right, so in the last time we have seen the clock group and we have seen clock de Verhelman, how to do it on there. And I've already been warning you that clocks are not really the topic that we want to look at, that clocks are not elliptic. And well, I also promised you some downsides of clocks. We'll get there later. Today we're going to see an alternative to clocks. And now what we have in a clock is a circle. And what I'll do for generalizing the clock for generalizing the clock to the subject of today's lecture, namely Edwards curves, is that I'm going to take the circle and push in a little bit on those, well, there's the diagonals, the points at 130, etc. So on the diagonals, I'm going to push it in a little bit. And so we get this picture. So you see that instead of having a bump going out here, you now have the curve going inwards. And the way that this comes is that I've introduced an extra term here. So it's x squared plus y squared, that's the equals 1 is a circle, or the clock. And now adding here a minus 30 x squared y squared. Well, if one of the points is 0, then we are still at the 0, 1, or 1, 0, and so on, at these points, at the special points on the circle. But for all the other points, we're getting closer to the origin. So the minus and then squares, so squares over the wheels are always positive, so there is something subtracted, so the point's going to be further inwards. And so if I now look at points there, well, this is P1, this is P2, um, these are actual coordinates, um, I also have to use a new addition law. And that's what I've been writing at the bottom here. So the Edwards curves x squared plus y squared equals 1 minus 30 x squared y squared, has an addition law which, well, in the numerators, looks exactly like the circle. So let's look at this part. So that's the x1, y2 plus y1, x2. This part matches the first part over here on the clock side. And also the numerator of the y-coordinate, the y1, y2 minus x1, x2, that matches the value on the clock. But Edwards curves have denominators. Now, these denominators are 1, and therefore equal to what the clock group has, if this term with a minus 30 or plus 30 is 0. That means if the product of the coordinates is 0. And OK, well, we're over a field, so the product of four things is 0 if at least one of those things is 0. So if, well, one of the points has 0 in its coordinates, say you're adding the so far neutral element and, well, we'll see in a moment it remains a neutral element, then the denominators continue to be 1. So if I now take this, well, let's say the neutral element here, so the 0, 1 point, as my second input point. So that means that x2 is 0. So it means that this part goes away, so we're looking at denominator 1 for the first coordinate, and this part goes away, so we're looking at denominator 0 for the second coordinate. And then for the, for the numerators, well, that is just the same as on the, as on the clock. And on the clock, we have shown that it's a neutral element. So here it is a neutral element. So we don't need to do a new proof there. That's kind of convenient. It's nice that 0, 1 remains a neutral element. And of course, that's also why I showed you the clock group first as a preparation for seeing an Edwards group. But then all the other interpretations go away. If you look at the example here of P1 plus P2 equals P3, if you look on the, on the left-hand side where we have the pizza pieces or the angles or the arc pieces, like all of these things add up, you can define the addition as the addition of angles, mod 360, as the uh, addition of arc lengths, mod 2 pi the radius, so well, radius is 1, so time mod 2 pi, or you can define it with the areas of these pieces. So piece of P1 plus the piece of P2 put together gives you P3. None of these hold on the Edwards side. So it doesn't match with, match with the angles, it doesn't match with the arc lengths, and it doesn't match with the areas. At first this is a bit of a bummer because, hey, we nicely understood why it was an addition law and that doesn't hold anymore. But actually it's a feature, it's not a bug. It's a feature because that means we don't have any of the easy attacks. If we had any nice interpretation, we could basically get back to something like the circle. So all the attacks 
that work on the circle that we'll see later in this quarter um, would then also work for the Edwards group. So it's, despite not being as intuitive, it is a nice feature that we don't have this nice interpretation. So, well, here we have an addition law, and okay, <laughs> I've been saying addition law, but is it actually one? Well, when you do study algebra and somebody gives you, hey, here's how you combine two elements, then you have to check a few things. You have to check that the result is a group element, that the addition law is associative, that you have a neutral element, okay, tick mark on that one, that you have negatives for all of those. Well, okay, we could show that again. Let's see, uh, does the clock idea still work? So if you take x, y, and then you take plus, well, remember on the clock it was, you're flipping from the positive side to the negative side, so you're taking x, the minus x, y, so same height, different x coordinate. If we plug this in here, well, we had shown that the x coordinate becomes zero, the y coordinate becomes one, and then we still have to work out why that actually did, does work over here, but okay, if the x coordinate is zero, there are only two points on this curve. So it's either that point or that point, and you can actually work it out um, that it's the correct point. But what I've been hiding here, what I've been brushing over is, oops, we're actually dividing here. Do we even have anything valid? We had suddenly looking at denominators, we could have a division by zero. So we can't even start to talk about a neutral element or negatives or uh, reason about whether this is a valid addition law if we don't even know whether it is defined everywhere. We might have exceptions. We might need to exclude some points as inputs. So let's look at these denominators. I've already said that, well, we have nice cases where the denominators are just one, and so we can just handle those up front. So if one of the coordinates, either the x or the y of first point or second point, happens to be zero, then the denominators are just one. Okay, so in those cases, they're definitely non-zero. So now we can continue with the assumption that the denominators are, well, that these coordinates, the x1, y1, x2, y2, that that product is not zero. So if we start with a point on the curve, and remember we had the circle, and then we bumped it in a little bit. On the left-hand side, we have the x squared plus y squared. Now we're over the reals, and so if we're taking a number and squared, it's a number that at most, well, at least zero. And it's non-zero, so it is strictly larger than zero. So everything on the left-hand side here, so this x squared plus y squared is larger than zero. And that means what we have over here, the 1 minus 30 x squared y squared, must be larger than zero. Or, if you flip things around, that means that what we're subtracting there, the 30 x squared y squared, is less than 1. That means that on the right side we have a number which is larger than 0. And that's what we're going to use now. So we're starting with two points, p1 and p2, or x1, y1, x2, y2, which are on the curve, and we've just seen that for every curve point we have that 30 x squared y squared is less than 1, and I'm not going to take the square root of that. So I'm taking, well, square root of 30 times and then taking the absolute value. Well, I need to do that because if I take minus something or plus something, it always squares to the same number. But if I take the absolute value, it's a positive number, and this value is a positive number less than 1. I do this for both of the points. So I have square root of 30 absolute value x1, x y1 being less than 1, and square root of 30 absolute value x2, y2 being less than 1. I think you can already see where this is going, because, well, look at the denominators up there. So there I'm having, well, 1 plus or minus 30, and then the product of all these guys. So if I now take the product of these two things, if I now multiply them, then I'm getting 30 and the absolute value of them. But, well, that just means I'm ignoring signs there. So if I do a plus or minus of those, it is still less than 1 in the absolute value, and that means if I take 1 plus or minus this thing, I'm getting something that's larger than 0. So that means it's not just 
not zero, it's even strictly larger than zero. So I'm dividing by something which is definitely non-zero. Now, if you trace through all the steps we've been doing, and bear with me for a moment that, okay, this 30 is going to be a general parameter of the curve. So we've been looking at x squared plus y squared equals 1 minus 30 x squared y squared. Let's just plug in d for that minus 30 there. Then whenever we have a minus 30, there will be d. Whenever we have plus 30, it will be minus d. And then each of those steps, okay, we would be seeing a square root of minus d here to get a positive number. All of the steps work the same. So we now have actually the same proof, if you go for the generality, for any d which is less than zero. So for those cases, we can talk about the addition law on the Edwards curve. Now the, the uh, Edwards curve here is now the more general form, x squared plus y squared equals one plus d x squared y squared. And I will insist on d being less than zero because, well, that's what my proof just used. It used that 30, well, that minus 30 was less than zero. I haven't shown you that the addition result is on the curve. It's a cumbersome computation, but you can just tell your computer to do it. Now that we know that we don't have any exceptional cases, all you do is, well, you have these two expressions, you plug them into a computer algebra system, you also tell your computer algebra system that those two things are on the curve. If you've done the exercises, the first batch of exercises, then you have done this for the clock group. And here it's a little bit more ugly because we have denominators and because the curve shape has this extra d x square y square, but there's nothing intellectually more challenging. So it's something you can leave to your computer. Similarly, associative law. Okay, quick recap. That means you can put parentheses every which way. So it means that a plus in parentheses b plus c is the same as a plus b in parentheses plus c. So you can't already swap around. That's commutativity. But associativity just means you can put the parentheses every which way. And again, I'm not showing it here, but it's something you can ask your favorite computer algebra system to do. Neutral element, I've shown you, 0, 1 is neutral element. And then I've stopped short of showing you that the denominators fit the 0, 1, but that's something you can prove for yourself and you should totally do so. One thing you can see here pretty easily is that the addition law is commutative. So that means it doesn't matter whether you're doing p1 plus p2 or p2 plus p1. And that you can see in the formulas. They are fully symmetric in 1 and 2. So, well, you can just flip the order here, doesn't hurt, flip the order here between 1 and 2, and it doesn't change anything. So for d less than 0, we don't have any exceptional cases. We have a nice, what we call, complete addition law. It works for any pair of inputs. Of course, you can also generalize from the curve to go for other curve shapes. Now, for d equals 0, we're back to the circle. So I want to look at d being larger than 0 here. I'm not point, uh, printing the d equals 1 case. Um, it's actually a funny case if you plot it. You're getting two parallel vertical lines, and you're getting two parallel horizontal lines. So you still have lines at 1, or points, and therefore lines at 1 minus 1, and one minus one here, but it's not uh, a connected curve. It's separate lines. And you can actually take this equation and then just factor it into, into products. And so, well, that is not a curve shape that we want to consider in crypto. Actually, all of these curve shapes here, also for d larger than zero, give you an elliptic curve, but they have exceptions. You can see here for the, well, let's do the right one first. So for the case that d is larger than one, you can see that these guys here will stretch to infinity and will then merge with the ones that come up here. And similarly for the infinity in the x direction. So we're missing points. So I can't draw all the points. And that's normally an indication that your addition law will have some exceptions. But you can see that also for the x squared y squared equals 1 plus d x squared y squared, for the case that d is larger than 1, you still have the same points that I highlighted before. You still have the points of order 1, 2, 4, and 4. But now there is no, well, the, what we always call this thing is a starfish. So the circle with the bumped in edges looks like a four-legged starfish. So the 
nice advanced curve where you see all the points. That's the starfish, and here you have something which, well, has a hollow middle, and then these paths shooting to infinity. And then over here we have something which looks a little bit like a traffic circle. And that is the case where D is between the circle and the exceptional case of the lines. So here we have D between 0 and 1. We have our four special points here. And then we also have points on the outside. So these are asymptotic to the lines at plus 1 and minus 1, also plus 1 and minus 1 in the vertical direction. So those are also Edwards curves, but they do not have the feature of being complete. So also on those, you can define addition law. It works for most cases, but just not everywhere.